Hi, I'm Meredith Blackwell, and I'm here at the Mycological Society of America meeting in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The year is 2019. And this is part of the oral history for mycology project that we initiated last year. And <coughs> today we're here to interview Joe Heitman. So, Joe, I would like to know where you were born, uh, what kind of family, did your family have a really academic background that encouraged you? What happened? Well, I was born in Ohio. I'm a Buckeye. Hmm. And um, What part? We lived in a very small town there called Lipsick. Okay. So I was born in Lima, and we My lived there. My uncle lived there. Yeah. My dad worked in a um, tomato canning plant there. He was hmm. the... Um, the plant engineer, so he was responsible for keeping the lines moving during canning season. And my mother thought there were better educational opportunities north of there, so we moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan when I was four or five, mm -hmm. and then into Portage, Michigan, where I grew up. And I lived in Holland for a while, ah. six years. My sister went to Hope College. Okay. <laughs> did she like it? <laughs> she did. She did okay. very well there. And then she went and did a master's at the University of Michigan. And mm -hmm. she's an elementary school teacher in Colorado okay. now. And you went a different way, in a way. I think uh, quite a few of us ended up being educators mm -hmm. of sorts in my family. And uh, my mother was a specialist in the teaching of reading. Mm -hmm. And she worked primarily as a substitute teacher while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Oh, so your family had been to college? And both both my parents went to college. Mm -hmm. My dad went to a um, um, the University of Chicago at Champaign Ur mm -hmm. Urbana as an engineering major. He's a mecha retired mechanical engineer, and my mother went to Chicago Teachers College and then Western Michigan University, and she went as far as a master's degree in the teaching of mm -hmm. reading and. And so were you destined to be a doctor when you started out? Or? Uh, I, I think you'd say I was a science nerd mm -hmm. at the core growing up. I, uh, early, early on. I had a microscope, a telescope, a rock collection, a rock tumbler. I was an amateur radio operator. I built oh, a lot okay. of radios and things. Um, and uh, gravitated towards science and math. And mm -hmm. And so that was grade school, high school? I think it probably started in elementary school, yeah. but um, my ninth grade honors biology teacher, John Gowdy, I think is the person who really put me on a track towards um, what I ended up doing in science. Mm -hmm. And um, he was my biology teacher in both ninth grade and twelfth grade. and. Um, I went to a public high school, Portage Northern High School, but it was unusual. There was a physics teacher, an outstanding calculus teacher, two chemistry teachers. We had both inorganic and organic chemistry, in including an organic chemistry lab in high school. That is unusual. Uh, Especially in the public school yeah, system. Yeah, it's hit or miss. Sometimes you get a good one. Oh, what about in, in college? Where did you go? I went to the University of Chicago. Okay. And I was a chemistry, biochemistry mm -hmm. major there. And at the time they had a special program. You could take both undergraduate and graduate classes at the same time. You could do a combined um, bachelor's, master's degree in a compressed four-year period. and it, it sounded like a good idea at the time, but they kept increasing the requirements the further I got into the program. So by the end, I think I had taken about eight graduate level classes and um, in organic chemistry and biochemistry and protein biochemistry, medical school biochemistry. And so your, your high school chemistry had really helped? It certainly did. That was an outstanding preparation. Mm -hmm. and and I, I worked in a whole series of labs while I was mm -hmm. there as well. And so were you one of many who wanted to go to med school? And there were quite a few um, students planning to go to mm -hmm. medical school. In my case, I started working in an organic chemistry lab 
if you did well in organic chemistry rather than doing the regular lab associated with the course, they would place you into an organic chemistry lab. And so I started working with uh, Joe Freed, and he had worked at um, Squibb. He'd been uh, in industry. Mm -hmm. He's one of the organic chemists that's credited with um, deducing that if you fluorinate biologically active molecules that it prolongs their half-life very dramatically because of the electronegative properties of fluorine. And he was interested in making natural products and also um, derivatives in the prostaglandin series of, of hormones. And he had several MD-PhD students that were working in his lab. So when I started there in the spring semester in the summer, they started telling me about the MD-PhD program. And that sounded like a great opportunity. Yeah. So you finished up in four years? I finished in four years. I graduated in 1984, and then I moved to Rockefeller and Cornell universities mm -hmm. in New York City for graduate school and medical school. And you were interested in fungi at the time, or how did that come about? Not at all. I was, um, I was interested in um, how proteins recognize specific DNA sequences. Mm -hmm. So I worked in a bacterial and phage genetics laboratory. My PhD advisor was Peter Modell, and the, the head of the laboratory was Norton Zinder, who had been um, Josh Lederberg's first graduate student. And um, Norton had discovered in Salmonella that phages can carry genetic information from one cell to another, what we know as transduction now. And then done, he did a lot of early work on the punctuation of the genetic code, um, the discovery of the first restriction systems, and then the, the birth of molecular biology. So it was a very exciting lab to be in. Um, but it was far from fungi, it was bacterial E. coli genetics. And but things you could apply to fungi later. It was, a, I would say, a fantastic grounding in mm -hmm. genetics and molecular biology. So then what happened? Well, a fellow student, Danny Lev, had been to take the yeast course at Cold Spring Harbor, and he came back just raving about this experience. And I'd been reading about things that I thought might be interesting for the next level. and applied and was accepted to take the yeast course. So Who taught that? Um, that was mm -hmm. Mark Rose, Fred Winston, and Phil Heater at that time. This was the summer of 1988. Mm -hmm. And so came back to where? I came back and finished medical school, or finished graduate school mm -hmm. in 1989, and then I um, took a leave of absence from medical school, and I went to do a uh, postdoctoral fellowship in Switzerland. And I worked with a young yeast geneticist there named Mike Hall, who was at the BioCenter, which is part of the University of Basel in Switzerland. And, and um, Mike had been there for a few years. He had trained with Ira Herskovitz um, at UCSF. and. Um, with John Beckwith before that, and uh, Tom Silhavi in bacterial genetics. So he had a similar kind of bacterial yeast genetics trajectory. And at the time, his lab was interested in how proteins were imported into the nucleus, how he had identified the first nuclear localization signal on a protein. And he was interested in understanding how you could take the sort of the primary sequence of the nuclear localization signal and translate that into movement through a nuclear pore and localize proteins to the nucleus. And very little was known at a molecular level then about the importance that recognized those signals or components of the nuclear pore. It was uncharted territory. And so we had a genetic screen to um, look for mutants uh, that would be resistant to a, um, a hybrid protein. It had a f nuclear localization signal of the alpha-2 homeodomain protein fused to beta-galactosidase. And the idea was it was jamming the nuclear pores and killing the cell. So we were isolating mutants that were resistant to this. And um, 
we just kept getting components that were in the yeast pheromone response pathway, which didn't make sense initially. Um, eventually, we deduced that it, this toxic protein wasn't actually jamming the nuclear pores. It was transinactivating the wild type alpha-2 protein and making the cells think that they were both mating types and they were auto-arresting. Um, so it, the, the project was essentially crashing and burning and I was starting to think about alternatives or <laughs> exit <laughs> strategies. Um, and I was reading in the library one day and I, I saw a paper from, it was in Nature by Max Tropschut. And he was studying this immunosuppressive drug called cyclosporin using Neurospora crassa as the model and uh, isolating mutants of Neurospora that were resistant to this gold standard immunosuppressive drug used for transplant medicine. And it, it was just very provocative and exciting. And I made a Xerox copy of the paper. This was at a time where Those you used days. the Xerox <laughs> machine. And I came back to Mike Hall's lab waving this reprint saying, this is the kind of thing we should be working on. And Mike said, well, uh, yeah, there's a fellow at Sando you need to talk to. His name is Raul Mova. And he's had some ideas about using as yeast as a model to study immunosuppressive drugs. And maybe he'll have some ideas. And so I called Rao. We met. And it turned out he had all sorts of exciting ideas. So we started a collaborative project then between academia and pharma to use Saccharomyces cerevisiae as a model for how immunosuppressive drugs work. Mm -hmm. So at that time, cyclosporin had been FDA approved, and uh, there were two experimental drugs that they were working on called FK506. We know this now as tacrolimus, and rapamycin, which is um, sirolimus. And we started isolating um, the gene encoding a, a binding protein that they'd identified at Sando. So they had made drug affinity columns and purified a binding protein called FKBP12 for FK506 binding protein of 12 kilodaltons. And they had micro sequenced it. So they had almost the entire amino acid sequence of the protein. And y so you could deduce what might be the, the sequence of the gene, but because of degeneracy of mm -hmm. codon usage, you, you couldn't be sure what the sequence of the gene would be. So we designed some pools of degenerate primers, and I spent a few weeks end labeling those primers and trying to screen a genomic library by hybridization. It just wasn't working well at all. And I had this idea one day that I, I, I had read about something called PCR, <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe I could take the two pools of degenerate primers and do PCR between the two and make a probe that would have perfect homology, and maybe that would work as a more effective probe. And I think I spoke with a few people, and they said, yeah, that, that might work. But nobody was doing PCR at that time at the Biocenter, but they had bought a new Perkin Elmer machine that was sitting in an unused lab on another floor. So I went and found the box and unpacked the PCR machine, read the manual, set it up, and set up a few reactions, and um, ran the first gel. And it, this was a, uh, I, um, agarose gel stained with lithidium bromide and you put it in the transilluminator and you couldn't see anything and I thought well of course it didn't work and but then I thought well maybe if I just destain it a little bit these are not going to be very large products so I was gently destaining this gel and suddenly you could see a band appear and cut it out with a, a scalpel and electroluted the DNA and made a probe and that that was how we cloned the gene encoding FKBP12 from yeast. Um, so I think it was amongst one of the first uses of degenerate PCR to, to clone a gene. And then the, the next experiment was to delete the gene and 
see what the phenotype might be. So at the time, it had been identified as this drug binding protein, but no one was really sure whether or not it would be relevant because it was so abundant and it was in every tissue in the body. And these drugs have a very specific action on T lymphocytes. So a lot of immunologists thought that this protein would be a red herring, so to speak. But we made a, a gene deletion allele, transformed it into yeast, both into haploids and diploids, in case it might be essential. And it was successful in deleting the gene in both settings. And it became clear the gene itself was not essential. Um, but deleting it did change some of the toxic activity of FK506. And um, even more prominently, it made um, yeast cells completely and absolutely resistant to rapamycin, which was much more potent. Um, so it became clear that the protein was critically involved for drug action. And um, so you have a binding protein, the drug binds to it. And the model was that this is the actual drug in the cell. It's a protein drug complex. So you could think of the drug as pro-drug. And then the question becomes, well, what's the target then of this complex? So we isolated spontaneous yeast rapamycin resistant mutants. And we could quickly show that they identified three genes, mutations in just the binding protein itself, which fit with gene deletion studies. But we identified mutations in two other genes that we named TOR1 and TOR2. Uh, and that stands for target of rapamycin. Um, and those turn out to be the conserved physiological targets for the drug, not only in yeast and other fungi, but all the way to human T cells. Um, so it, was, it turned out to be successful after a, a failed postdoctoral project. So you sometimes failure is what leads to yeah. a success. And well, you completely changed your direction, almost. Well, people sometimes ask, why did you go to medical school? And I, I don't practice medicine. I didn't. I completed medical school, but I didn't do any clinical training. But it's an amazing education, and it changes the way you think about science and problems mm -hmm. and how you frame problems. At, at the time, we were really interested in trying to understand how signals were transmitted from outside to inside the cell. And the idea was maybe we could use some drugs or chemicals or natural products to inhibit those and target the steps in between the receptors and the transcription factors that people were working on. And uh, the, these immunosuppressive drugs had identified intermediate signaling components. In the case of TOR, it's a novel protein kinase. In the case of cyclosporin and FK506, um, Jun Liu and Stuart Schreiber's lab discovered that their common target is a phosphatase called calcineurin that's also conserved all the way from fungi to humans. And the antifungal activities of those natural products are mediated via the same targets as well. So you stayed in Basel how long? I was there a little less than two years. Oh, gosh, you got a lot done. And yeah. then... I came back to New York City and finished medical school in 1992. I graduated in June, and then in September I moved to North Carolina mm -hmm. to start at um, uh, Duke University in what was then the Department of Genetics. And, and you've been there ever since? I have. Uh, September 1st will be mm -hmm. 27 years. Wow. And you're an administrator but before you got there. What happened? <laughs> before I became an administrator. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, the first year or two, I set up my lab working on yeast as a model system. And I often say I was a myopic yeast geneticist. <laughs> I w worked on one organism, one lab strain, sort of one problem. And then my first student, Mike Lorenz, became interested in nutrient sensing and began working on both the role of the TOR pathway in nutrient sensing, but on pseudohyphal differentiation that had just been rediscovered in the Fink lab. And um, 
is a very interesting dimorphic transition that this yeast can undergo. In Candida? This was in Saccharomyces was in cerevisiae. Saccharomyces, okay. Yeah, so um, the budding yeast had a whole other mm -hmm. life cycle that um, had been um, unappreciated for many, many years, in part because the lab strains as they were domesticated to be lab strains, people had selected against flocculation and fuzzy colonies. Yeah. And uh, it turns out later they have a mutation in flow 8 that blocks their differentiation. So we started working on nutrient sensing and pseudohyphal differentiation. And then um, one day the phone rang in my office. And it was John Perfect, who is now the ID division chief at Duke. And he was looking for a yeast geneticist to work on a pathogenic yeast called Cryptococcus. Um, and he had a previous collaborator with whom they developed a, a biolistic transformation system. He had taken the yeast course himself in 1987 and come back from that experience thinking that the field of medical mycology needed to do something more like yeast genetics and um, develop molecular biology and genetics for these pathogens. And his focus was on cryptococcus because of his, some of his early clinical experiences with patients. Um, and he'd called all the other yeast geneticists on campus and none of them were interested. So I was the last person he called. And I, I went over to his office and he had some reprints about activity of cyclosporin against cryptococcus. And I left with a few reprints and a petri dish with the type strain on it. And we started working on it essentially right away in the lab. But what I think really sealed my fate in a transition into medical mycology was he sent two people to work with me. One was an undergraduate that had worked in his lab one summer named Audrey Odom. And Audrey worked in my lab for three years while she was an undergraduate. And I don't think either of us, I don't think she appreciated how good she was. She ultimately was an MD-PhD student at Duke, and then she went on to pediatric infectious disease training at the University of Washington, joined the faculty at Wash U, working on developing novel um, targets for drug development for malaria. And she's just moving to Children's Hospital in uh, Philadelphia. She's going to be the infectious disease division chief there for pediatrics. But she was one of the first people to work on cryptococcus in my lab. She published three papers as an undergraduate, and her work led to three NIH R01 grants funded on cryptococcus. So subsequently, I've had 46 undergraduates in my lab trying to continue to repeat that level of success. Um, the other person that he sent to me was a medical fellow named Andy Alspa, and he's now a full professor at Duke and um, very well established medical mycologist working on cryptococcus. And he directed the Woods Hole Molecular Mycology course. He's been on the pathogenic eukaryote study section and trained a whole cadre of very talented um, graduate students, some of whom are now running their own labs. Um, Liz Ballou in Birmingham, and Teresa O'Meara just took a faculty position at the University of Michigan. And there's, there's a young undergraduate here who told me today that she just accepted a, a job working in Teresa's lab in Ann Arbor that they're both very excited about. So they were the first two people in the lab to work on cryptococcus and um, really set us on a strong path forward. Well. I, I was really, really interested in, in the work you were doing with the strain of Gadii that was up in the Pacific Northwest. And could you were telling me the other day, but could you talk about that a little bit? Because you got out in the field and actually got these strains, or did someone else do it? Well, them the person who went out in the field to really look at where Cryptococcus gaudii was in Vancouver and Vancouver Island was Karen Bartlett, who's on the faculty at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Um, so she is an environmental microbiologist, and 
she did air sampling and tree and soil sampling and there were also a lot of um, clinical cases so there were isolates mm -hmm. coming from clinical microbiology laboratories and there were quite a few animal cases as well both in companion animals and wild animals. So those were from vets? Those were coming from veterinarians that's right so dogs, <coughs> cats, porpoises and a, a variety of other animals as well. Um, so this is an outbreak that started um, in the late 1990s on Vancouver Island and then um, spread to the mainland and then we were involved with Karen Marr in identifying one of the very first cases in the states. It was an older gentleman that lived on um, Orcas Island in the San Juan archipelago of Washington yeah. State and Puget Sound. And with Karen and others, we um, um, did a lot of surveillance in Washington State and Oregon State. And a former student of mine, Eddie Burns, was very active in that. And so we were involved in um, some of the early work on the isolates from Vancouver Island and then this expansion into the, the U.S. that occurred. I remember getting interested in Gaddy Eye when uh, June Quantung spoke about it. She was a, a, one of the speakers, uh, distinguished speakers. Now, I guess it's uh, got a new name, but the lecture, the, it's a Carling lecture now. But I remember she was talking about it before anyone knew mm -hmm. where to isolate it. So it used to be considered a variety. Mm -hmm. There was cryptic, several varieties of cryptococcus, variety grubii and variety neoformans and variety gaudii. And then somewhere around 2000, um, maybe 1999, there was a meeting in Adelaide, Australia, the International Cryptococcus Meeting, and there was a large discussion about it. And all the accumulating evidence was that cryptococcus neoformans and what we now recognize as Cryptococcus scottii were separate species. But the debate at that time was this was a varietal designation, so you could not canonize it as a species designation. But everyone called it Gaudii, including all the Australians, and there really was no other tenable name that people would accept or would be workable. And I remember raising my hand at the meeting and saying, I think we should call it Cryptococcus gaudii, and um, some of the people who were there at the time say that I was um, um, spanked by the nomenclature committee, <laughs> you might say. <laughs> um, but um, <coughs> Jun Quan Chung and Tun Bukout and others um, wrote a very thoughtful nomenclature paper that was published uh, making the case to um, elevated to a species designation. And that was generally accepted by the community, and so isolates that had been designated as different uh, varieties became the two distinct species, Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gaudii. And what, what we can see today or know today from a lot of the whole genome sequencing data is that these are each species complexes now, and they're described as the Cryptococcus neoformans species complex and the Cryptococcus gaudii species complex. And it looks like there's probably five species in each of those complexes. And um, So there may be some merit in having additional names. And Tun Bukat has proposed a, a seven-name system that um, many people in the community are using. But uh, admittedly, it's a little bit confusing for clinical medicine. Um, but you mentioned Jun Quan Chung. She's a very senior icon in the field at the NIH. And she was the person who discovered the sexual cycles of Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gaudii and also Histoplasma capsulatum and did a lot of the early pioneering work on both Cryptococcus and Aspergillus fumigatus. And she has an active lab that continues to this day. And she has, um, I would say, an encyclopedic knowledge and memory of medical mycology. And uh, that's a tremendous resource for all of us who moved into the field from mm -hmm. very different kinds of backgrounds. And 
that kind of expertise is just invaluable in a field. And she's still very excited about it, and everything that she to is. do with her area. She is. I was there visiting the NIH oh, a year or so ago, and there'd been some sort of celebratory event, and she saved me a piece of cake <laughs> for it. So <laughs> not only does she take care of us scientifically, she takes care of us personally. And well, I was very disappointed a couple of weeks ago. Her daughter was performing. She's a concert pianist. Yes. And she was performing in South Carolina. But I didn't know in time to plan to go, and it was a horrible stormy night, so I decided I wouldn't try. It was only about an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And so she gave me a, a place where I could hear it, and um, electricity went out. I didn't, my computer wasn't fully charged, and so I, I didn't get to hear the daughter. So. But anyway, no, she's been, been a real inspiration to me, and I just loved hearing her talk. But anyway, <coughs> she got me interested in it, and of course it was just a cursory interest, but you, you got me interested again with the business of the outbreak in British Columbia and Oregon and Washington, so that was really interesting to me. So is there anything else you want to say? And well, I would say there was another inflection point in my trajectory in it. Um, involved being asked to be on the PhD thesis committee of Tim James, oh. who at the time was a graduate student with Redis Vilgelis at Duke. And um, I always say I learned more from Tim than he ever learned from me. His thesis project was focused on identifying mating type loci throughout the Basidiomyces, including tetrapolar and bipolar species. and um, I just learned a tremendous amount of mycology from Tim about transitions from heterothalism to homothalism. And um, my understanding of homothalism was limited to the mating type switching system of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And Tim was a very patient mycological Talmudic scholar, I would <laughs> say, and um, walking me through. Um, other patterns of transitions that have occurred. And uh, Redis um, had this idea that it would be useful to study the species related to the pathogenic species complex and helped us frame and understand what would be the nearest species to focus on. And these are not model systems. There's very few isolates for any of them. And they had exotic names like Souchier vingfieldii and Bulera dendrophila and Phyllobasidiella depauperatus. And so I remember coming back from one of the Cryptococcus genome sequencing meetings with Redis on a plane. And we sketched out on a, on a napkin or an envelope this um, grand scheme to focus on a whole panel of species. And um, so that changed a lot, the trajectory of my own lab mm -hmm. to focus on the mating type locus and its evolution, patterns and modes of sexual reproduction. And we ultimately discovered a very unusual form of homothalism in cryptococcus where an isolate can mate with itself, um, but there aren't two versions of the mating type locus. They only have one mating type locus, and they don't even need the key mating type genes from it um, in most cases, and they can undergo um, a, a selfing unisexual mm -hmm. reproduction cycle. Um, and th there are some other fungal examples of this as well. Louise Glass, who's at the meeting, right. um, discovered some examples of this in Neurospora species. and. Brenda Wingfield has discovered some other examples of this. So this is a, a, f a fourth type of homothalism in fungi. Um, so I um, give great credit to Redis and Tim and taking a fairly senior investigator and um, lighting up a new path for them on a very exciting area. And I think that's probably what um, might lead me to be a mycologist now rather than just a myopic yeast geneticist. You, know, you keep learning, and that's good. Okay, well, thank you very much for taking the time out. And, uh, thank you, Meredith. We will let you know when this is up on Great. YouTube.
Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad you're doing this. Thank <laughs> you for inviting me.